Shubhina, you can start. Uh, shall we start, sir? Uh, yeah, hi, everyone. A very good evening. Uh, hope everyone is safe and healthy at home. And today's topic of discussion is demystifying HFNC therapy in ICU. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Supradeep Ghosh and Dr. Anirban Chaudhary, who will discuss uh, uh, who will share their experience on HFNC in the critical care department. Uh, Dr. Supradeep Ghos is a director in the head of Depart department of critical care medicine in Fortis Escort Hospital, Faridabad. He is the founder chairman of Flu Fluid Academy of India. Uh, sir, a very warm well welcome to our webinar. And our second speaker is Dr. Anirban Home Chaudhary. He is a director professor of anesthesia and critical care in GV Panth Hospital, New Delhi. Sir has published 57 papers and has a patent in his name. Recently, he is awarded with the Sir Pali Radhakrishna Distinguished Professor Award. Uh, with this, I would like to hand over the mic to Dr. Uh, Supradeep Ghosh, and he will share his experience in the HFNC therapy in the post situation. Over to you, sir in hypoxemic respiratory dis disease, sorry. I thank the Fisher and Tackle 
and uh, uh, the organizers for uh, start uh, for uh, uh, approaching us, uh, me and Anirban, to talk about this very very important topic, which is very relevant in today's scenario. So I I will be speaking about the role of high flow nasal cannula or nasal oxygenation in hypoxemic respiratory failure. And followed by Anirban will be speaking about the uh, role of HFNC in post extubation uh, as a prophylaxis, as a prophylaxis for uh, reducing the extubation failure and weaning failure and reintubation following the extubation, following a planned extubation. And uh, to start the topic, um, uh, my uh, I'll be talking mostly about the the physiologic principles behind utilizing the hypo, HFNC therapy in hypoxemic respiratory failure. What is the current evidence available for us? Every good thing comes with some price. So I shall be talking about the problem of HFNC and when we should actually intubate these patients. And finally, uh, I will also talk about the role of HFNC while intubation process in a patient with hypoxemic respiratory failure. So I hope I'm uh, visible. Yeah. So yes, coming sir. to the physiologic uh, things. The, first of all, HFNC reduces our overall breathing effort. As you can see from this very study by Tommaso Mori uh, and his colleagues from Milan, Italy, they, uh, in, they, they utilize the HFNC therapy and face mask therapy alternatively in 15 patients of hypoxemic respiratory pain. And they published this study in two different journals in two different uh, things. One was published in Blue Journal and second paper was published in Intensive Care Medicine. If you see in the left-hand side, in the Blue Journal publication, you can see by utilizing HFNC, there was a significant reduction in the inspiratory effort, which can be measured from the dip in the esophageal pressure or dip in the surrogate of pleural pressure. So HFNC reduces the initial inspiratory effort of our patients who are in distress because of hypoxemic respiratory failure. At the same time, if, if, if we see with, as we increase the flow further from 30 liter to 45 liter to 60 liters, HFNC also reduces the overall work of breathing, which can be, um, which is surrogate is a, uh, what you call pressure time products. This was published in intensive care medicine. So HFNC reduces the overall work of breathing and overall breathing effort. And this is absolutely proportional with the amount of flow we are giving. What about oxygenation? Compared to face mask, HFNC increases the oxygenation. Even if the initial delivered flow, the uh, initial delivered FiO2 of the pipe gas is same, but with the increase in the flow from 30 liter to 45 liter to 60 liter, there is an increase in the PaO2, FiO2 of the patient. How it is possible? There are three possible explanations for the increase in oxygenation with HFNC therapy. Number one, it, the flow provided by the HFNC machine, which is up to 60 liters, in some machines up to even 80 or 100 liters per minute, which is probably not uh, um, uncomfortable for the patient, but we usually use up to 50 or 60 liters per minute. The flow of the HFNC machine, it try to match the patient's demand. So there will be loss, uh, 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 there will be less entrainment of the room air, thus it increases the uh, L delivered FiO2 in the alveoli. Secondly, HFNC can deliver, the pipe gas can be delivered up to 100%. Thirdly, HFNC by increasing the uh, end expiratory lung volume can provide a little bit up to two to five centimeter water of the positive end expiratory pressure, provided the patient's mouth is not the uh, mouth is not up. So HFNC by these three mechanisms increases the oxygenation and oxygenation increases further with the increase in the flow. What about the effect on PaCO2? 
as we know, uh, as we can see from this graph in the left hand side, the with HFNC, there is a drop in the respiratory rate, as we can see from the blue graphics. The respiratory rate decreases with the increase in flow. Similarly, there is a decrease in the minute ventilation. So despite the decrease in the minute ventilation and the respiratory rate, the PCO2 remains stable in patients who are on HFLC. How it is possible? You can see the graph in the left-hand side, the, the red graph, the brown red graph, it is showing the dead space ventilation. As we increase the flow, the dead space ventilation also decreases and patients' uh, dead space washout increases. But this, this is probably the reason why there, may, there is a major uh, no change in the patient's overall increase in the PCO2. But as you see from these graphics, beyond 35 or 40 liters per minute, this dead space washout doesn't increase further. So PCO2, the maximum decrease in the PCO2 or maximum uh, stability of the PCO2 can be maintained with a flow of around 35 to 40 liters per minute. Apart, apart from that, because there is a decrease in the respiratory effort, the, there is a decreased production of the PCO2. This is also one of the reasons which is contributing to the uh, overall stability in the PSCO2 of the patients. What about patient comfort? HFNC, we all know from our clinical experience, the HFNC significantly improves the patient comfort, especially when compared to the, uh, um, the, the conventional low flow oxygen therapy or non invasive ventilation. How? Because HFNC, as we have discussed, is increases the end expiratory lung volume, it increases the recruitment, increases the lung compliance, it decreases the respiratory drive, decreases the uh, respiratory rate and minute ventilation. Does it decrease the work of breathing? It decreases the respiratory effort. It also provides an adequate humidity so that overall, because of everything together, there is an increase and significant improvement in the patient's level of comfort. So this is what we can achieve with HFNC therapy in, uh, in hypoxemic respiratory failure. Do we have evidence? Yes, of course, we have strong evidence in favor of HFNC. The, uh, the, the biggest study which came uh, to light is, is way back in 2015 by Fratt and his colleagues who studied the role of HFNC compared to standard oxygen and non-invasive ventilation in patients of pure hypoxemic respiratory failure. That means the patients who had got a PF ratio of less than 300 with a PSU of less than 45 and at respiratory rate over 25. They were divided into three groups. One group received HFNC therapy, second group received non-invasive ventilation inter with intermittent HFNC, meaning thereby when patients were not receiving non-invasive ventilation, they were getting HFNC. And third group received only standard oxygen. The primary outcome was uh, the intubation rate at day 28 there was no significant difference in the primary outcome. That is intubation remain, rate remains same at day 28 in all the three groups. But in patients who are more severely ill, patients who had a PF ratio of less than 200, HFNC significantly decreased the rate of intubation compared to standard oxygen or an IV group. Apart from that, HFNC group also received a higher 28 days ventilator free days. And what we can see uh, from the graph in the right side, the 90 days probability of survival was significantly higher in HFNC group compared to standard oxygen group and non-invasive ventilation, ventilation group. I would also like to emphasize that most of these patients, more than 80% of these patients, 310 patients had bilateral lung infiltrate chest infiltrate, uh, but since they were not receiving any positive and expiratory pressure, so they did not fulfill the criteria of body definition, but they almost qualify for the uh, ARDS definition as per the body criteria, except the PEEP of five. What about immunocompromised patients? So people enthusiastic, people become very, very enthusiastic. 
Let's try HFLC in immunocompromised patients. You know, there is a very old study published in 2004 or 2005 by Nicholas Hill. And they found that in immunocompromised patients, if you use non-invasive ventilation compared to the standard oxygen, the patient's mortality improves and patient, less patients receive invasive mechanical ventilation. But subsequent studies could not prove it. But people still became very enthusiastic less because immunocompromised patients, they have a higher risk of catching some infection. So why not we try with HFNC uh, compared to standard oxygen in these patients? And they wanted to see in these 776 immunocompromised patients with pure hypoxemic respiratory failure from 32 ICUs of France, whether HFNC can reduce the mortality at day 28. But unfortunately, this study was a uh, negative study. They did not find an overall difference in mortality at day 28 between standard oxygen group and HFNC group. However, there was a higher PF ratio at day three in HFNC group compared to the standard oxygen group. Now, why they failed? Why this study failed? This study failed because immunocompromised patients are different patients compared to our uh, routine ICU patients. They take a longer time for their recovery because they take longer time for their recovery. So there is a higher propensity for them to require invasive ventilation compared to the patients who are treated in ICU. Our patients, if you see pneumonia patients, they come to us. Those who recover, they recover within three or four days time. But in immunocompromised patients, the same patients, they may require six or seven or eight days time. That may be the reason why this study failed to show any benefit of HFLC overall in terms of mortality. What about meta-analysis? So there were uh, a recently, um, uh, in 2019, intensive care medicine, this guy from, uh, from Canada, Roach, where he published a meta-analysis and he found that uh, in terms of mortality, there was no significant difference between the HFNC group and the standard oxygen group. But the meta-analysis has clearly established if we give HFNC as the initial therapy, as the initial therapy or initial oxygenation strategy compared to the standard oxygen, there is a significantly lowering of uh, intubation rate in our patients. That's a significant benefit that you are reducing the intubation rate of intubation in your patients of HF, or if, if you apply HFNC compared to the standard oxygen. But we know that this, there is a big problem of delaying intubation in, in these patients. So there is a, we are often, uh, we, we just apply HFNC or NIV, non-invasive ventilation to our patients and we are very happy because they are maintaining the oxygenation. So let's, uh, let's uh, keep it cool and just continue with the therapy. But we, we actually can harm these patients until unless we are very careful that intubation should not be delayed. As can be seen from this widely published study from South Korea, where they found, they analyzed 175 patients who who were on HFNC for hypoxemic respiratory failure and who were subsequently intubated. They, uh, they divided these patients into two groups. The first group of patients, they received endotracheal intubation within 48 hours. The second group, they received endotracheal intubation delayed after 48 hours. And many of them actually received after four or five days. And what happened? The early intubation, if the, these patients are intubated early, that means within 48 hours, there was a significant lower ICU mortality, significantly higher extubation success, and significantly more ventilator-free days. Meaning thereby, this, is, this data clearly shows that unnecessarily delaying intubation is not good. So we need to protect, uh, 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 we need to predict when exactly to intubate, right? So let's see how these things happen. Why this spontaneous breathing sometimes may be harmful. This is a very famous picture from critical care medicine published by Yoshida and his colleague from Japan. And if you see the left-hand side, there are, there's a beautiful diagram of lung alveoli. And uh, out of, there are four diagrams. The left-hand side corner is the patient with, oh, sorry. 
patients with mild lung injury. These are the patients with mild lung injury, and they and these are the patients with severe lung injury. These are not exactly patients. I'm so sorry. These are rabbits. So rabbits with severe lung injury and rabbits with mild lung injury, severe lung injury. These patients with mild lung injury, when they did not have any spontaneous breathing effort, they have worse, worse alveolar picture compared to patients who receive spontaneous breathing effort. But it is exactly the opposite. If the severe lung injury patients receive spontaneous breathing effort, as can be seen from this picture, the risk of injury is more compared to patients who are not receiving the spontaneous breathing effort. This is because the huge swings in the transponent pressure when the patient is breathing very fast and presently taking a huge respiratory effort, as can be seen from the right-hand side graph. So just to summarize, the potential mechanisms of harm from HFNC therapy is number one, that is the uncontrolled breathing effort, particularly if the patient is severely ill. So there is a potential for uh, something called PCD or patient self-induced lung injury. By the way, all students, I request you and I suggest you to go through this paper by Lauren Rochard, Arthur Slatsky and Antonio Presenti which was published in 2017 in Blue Journal. It is available free of cost in the internet. You must read this. This is probably the first paper where the PCV was described, okay? Second mechanism is too much of swings in the transponent pressure as we have seen in the previous slide. Uh, this uh, increasing the lung stress and leading to barrel trauma. Too much of large tidal volume. We know when our patient is not paralyzed, patient is not intubated, we do not have any control over the tidal volume. So patient may actually take a large tidal volume breath, uh, uh, leading to more lung strain and volume trauma. Finally, we know HFNC can only provide two to five centimeter water of PEEP. And sometimes in sick patient especially, we need a, a, a good amount of PEEP just to maintain the alveolar recruitment. If you don't do it, there is a higher risk of at electrotrauma especially when our patients or HFNC are on mouth breathing. Now, how can you predict it? Now, who require? We know that we need, to, we need to start the patients of hypoxemic respiratory failure with HFNC therapy because of many, many reasons, but we also need to uh, regularly watch this patient when to intubate. Now, how can you predict it? So one way of predicting is, is simple clinical things like uh, look for a uh, non-pulmonary organ dysfunction, for, for example, patient is in circulatory shock, do not delay the intubation, intubate this patient. Second, the patient is having a huge right, uh, respiratory rate or patient's oxygenation is not improving. So these are the patients who can require uh, intubation. Now, just to simplify the thing, this uh, gentleman, Oriel Roca and his colleagues from Barcelona, Spain, they, uh, they came up with this index called ROX index. What is ROX index? ROX index is simply a ratio of SpO2 by FiO2 to respiratory rate. And they also did a multicenter prospective cohort study just to prove their point. They found in their study, if the ROX index is more than 4.88 at, uh, at uh, two hours, six hours, and 12 hours after the HFNC initiation, this is significantly associated with a lower risk of intubation, meaning thereby, if the ROX index remains more than 4.88 at hour two, hour six, and hour 12, you can continue with the HFNC. On the contrary, if the ROX index is below 2.85, below 3.47, and below 3.85 at hour two, hour six, and hour 12 after HFNC initiation, this predicts HFNC failure, meaning thereby, if the ROX index as hour two is less than 2.5, or at hour six is less than 3.7, or at hour 12 is less than 3.85, these patients should be intubated. They also found a lower increase in the ROX index over time predicts the need for intubation. So based on this ROX index, recently there is a recommendation. So we start the patient on HFNC. We measure the ROX index at hour two. If the ROX index is less than 2.585, intubate these patients. 
If the ROCS index is more than 4.88, continue with the monitoring. If the ROCS index is between 2.85 and 4.87, you check the ROCS index after 30 minutes. If there is a change in the ROCS index by less than 0 0.5, consider endotracheal intubation. If the change in the ROCS index is more than or equal to 0 0.5, continue to monitor and look for ROCS index again at hour six, and similarly at hour 12. So this algorithm may be useful in our patients. Simple algorithm and can be utilized at the bedside. Finally, HFNC is very, very useful for pre-oxygenation. We all know that uh, there are at least two large randomized trials where non-invasive ventilation was found to be uh, much beneficial compared to any other strategy for pre-oxygenation, especially in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. So Dr. Fratt and his colleagues uh, tried to study whether HFNC can be as good as an IV or not for pre-oxygenation. So keeping in mind that uh, things, uh, they studied 322 patients for pre-oxygenation, either with HFNC or pre-oxygenation uh, with uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation. What they found, the um, during HFNC could be continued even during laryngoscopy whereas non-invasive ventilation could not be continued during laryngoscopy. And the outcome, they did not find any difference in severe hypoxemia during intubation. However, patients with a PF ratio of less than 200, there was a lower rate of severe hypoxemia and NIV group. So uh, just to cut the story short, uh, HFNC is overall, just utilizing HFNC is overall same as non-invasive ventilation, which is almost like a standard of care now. Now, if we utilize both the things together, the advantage we'll have is uh, patients who are on HFNC plus non-invasive ventilation, they can have the benefit of non-invasive ventilation and the oxygenation can be continued even during laryngoscopy. So this study, this is a pilot study conducted by Samir Zawar and his team in 2016 called OptiNIV study, where they compared HFNC plus NIV versus only an IV, where they used a sham, sham HFNC. And they tried to see whether this improves the outcome. There, since it was a pilot study, the primary outcome was uh, what was what, uh, the lowest SpO2 during intubation. And they found a combined strategy of HFNC plus an IV uh, produces a significant decrease in the lowest SpO2 during intubation. Now, uh, I know it's, 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 it's quite, it may not be cost effective, but I suggest your patients who are on HFNC for hypoxemic respiratory failure already, because HFNC decreases the intubation rate. And if they require endotracheal intubation, then you can apply non-invasive ventilation over and above your HFNC and continue it even during laryngoscopy that can probably improve the overall SpO2, drop in SpO2 in the uh, group, in, in, your, in your patients. And this is the strategy which was suggested by a recent paper by Rikard and, and team that if the patient's a PF ratio is less than 100, add uh, non-invasive, uh, add, 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 add HFNC during laryngoscopy. You can also think of, consider, using HFNC during laryngoscopy if the PF ratio is less than 200. If the PF ratio is between 200 and 300, maybe you can think of that. So particularly in patients who has got a uh, very severe hypoxemia, moderate to severe hypoxemia, consider using HFNC along with NIV during pre-oxygenation and during intubation period. So ladies and gentlemen, my take home message is HFNC should be the initial non-invasive respiratory support in all patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, especially so for patients who has got a PF ratio of less than 200 or respiratory rate is more than 25 and those who have a PSU2 definitely less than 45 millimeter of market. Uh, sorry, 45 centimeter of, uh, millimeter of market. It clearly reduces the need for intubation. 
but endotracheal intubation should not be delayed. Consider non-pulmonary organ failure, severity of baseline hypoxemia. We have seen that in patients who have got a PF ratio of less than 200 or maybe less than 150, they have higher propensity to uh, require, uh, requiring endotracheal intubation. No improvement in hypoxemia as we have seen the ROCS index or patients who have got a large respiratory effort. Consider intubating them early, do not delay it. HFNC is useful during endotracheal intubation for moderate to severe hypoxemic failure. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So I would like to invite my friend, uh, Professor Anurman Hongchaudhary for delivering his talk on um, role of HFNC during, during post extubation, sir. Post extubation. Thank you. Dr. Ghosh, I, I must say that you have made my job easier because you have explained nicely the very basics. And since the basic physiology remains the same, and so it becomes easier for me to explain the role of HFNC in extubation failure or potential extubation failure as the case may be. Are my slides visible, Himangshu? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is. Okay. So we know that as nicely elaborated by Dr. Ghosh, the path or the journey from the onset or the initiation of mechanical ventilation to the liberation from mechanical ventilation is not that simple. It definitely has a few signposts, like when the patient is ready to be weaned off. I mean, the part of the work load of breathing can be offloaded from the ventilators to the lungs, native lungs. So we say it is ready to wean. So that occurs when some of these factors or all of these factors are present, like reversal of the cause of respiratory failure, GCS score of more than eight, patient is able to breathe spontaneously, PF ratio more than 200 and hemodynamic stability. Now, more often, you know, all factors in a patient may not be present. Some factors are present. And that's why we try to relate things because it is more of a mix between art and science. Pure objective measurements cannot always take to the path of the correct decision. So the next signpost would be definitely where the patient is ready to breathe on his own and the ventilator can be totally offloaded at the dispense of the patient's lungs. So in that case, the patient should have additional features like ability to cough, this oxygen saturation more than 90% on an FIO to a 0.4, the respiratory rate less than 35, requirement of PEEP less than 8, and the rapid shallow breathing index of less than 105. Again, this is also not the rule. Maybe we can consider most of these factors uh, at times and considering the state of the patient, his pre-existing disease, co-existing disease, the, how the patient has responded to the treatment, what are the chances that the treatment might fail or there may be a chance factor in this. So all again considered, we ultimately disconnect and then we move on to the third important signpost, which is the ready to extubation. So here again, we rely upon our judgment on successful 30 minutes of spontaneous breathing trial, besides all those factors. But in spite of the fact, I think that at many times, it can be associated with a number of life-threatening complications, and that may require the resumption of mechanical ventilation. So therefore, the weaning may fail, and it may fail for reasons which are related to the respiratory failure, or they may not be related to the respiratory failure at all. They may be re 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 related to the sepsis per se, or the car cardiac comorbidities per se. So therefore, resumption of mechanical ventilation doesn't always mean that the respiratory failure is directly the <clears throat> cause which is leading to the, to the failure of, of weaning or the failure of extubation, but there can be a cumulative effects. So simple weaning refers to patients who succeed the first weaning test and are extubated without any difficulty. Difficult weaning refers to those who fail the first weaning test and require up to three tests or seven days to achieve successful weaning. And prolonged weaning refers to patients who require more than seven days of weaning after the first. So these have all been scientifically validated and therefore we go wide. Although initially it started as a mere permutation and combination. 
But because the importance of extubation failure is increased manifold in patients who have multi-organ dysfunction, therefore, many studies were conducted which tried to identify the risk factors from the extubation failure. So in most of the studies, it was seen that one of the, the common risk factors which were identified were one age, the elderly people were more at a risk of extubation failure. Those with Apache 2 at the time of winning higher Apache 2, that is the severity of the disease was higher than the normal, were also at very high risk of extubation failure. Then in many times, Glasgow Coma Scale was found to be very closely associated with the poor GCS leading to extubation failure. And of course, other factors like <clears throat> the, this anemia, the cardiochronic and chronic diseases, the positive fluid balance, and other neurological causes, they were also there. But these factors, the age, the Apache 2, the GCS, so these were some of the common factors which were noted in different studies which have different cohorts of patients. Some studies included neurosurgical patients, some studies included cardiology patients, some studies. So, but these were the common factors which had to be addressed. So whenever we, we come across such factors, the risk of extubation failure should be kept in mind. And the, the, the process of separation from the ventilator, that phase, that becomes critical because that is the phase where the chances of reintubation is maximum. Now, this is also a famous paper by Esteban and his team, although it is multicentric, it was published in 2011, long before this HFN. But what is the effect of reintubation after scheduled extubation? Because if the patients needed to have reintubated, if you see, he had I included around <clears throat> eleven fifty-two patients, of which eight hundred and sixteen did not require reintubation, and there the mortality you can see is around six percent. So once the patient had an extubation failure, so they were subjected to non-invasive ventilation, <clears throat> and non-invasive ventilation it was successful the non-reintubation patients had a mortality of 8%. So there was a jump. Those patients in whom non-invasive ventilation was either not suitable or non-invasive ventilation failed, that is 135 in whom they were not suitable, so they were directly reintubated, and 45 in whom reintubation was done, but it did not work. So that they had a second intubation. So then again, the, they plummeted the mortality. So if the patients had another intubation, reintubation, then again, the mortality for those who could not be revived was very high, 25%. So you see the steps which leading to reintubation clearly shows that reintubation has a very high odds with mortality. More the number of reintubation, more the chances of mortality. So therefore, the decision to extubation at the right time should be based on the simple fact that all the chance factors that might lead to reintubation can be harmful to the patient, particularly in certain groups of patients. Now, if we see most of the studies, again, they were they included different groups of patients on different, some of them were by the Esteban's team only. We find that in most of the studies, it ranged somewhere between 10 to 20 percent. The maximum was 20, 30 with 10 percent, the rate of extubation failure. Although the ICU mortality significantly seemed to differ, differ because it was it varied from 48 to 43 percent. So therefore, definitely we can say that at least some patients had a very high risk of mortality at the cost of reintubation. And when we see that this was 43 percent against the ICU mortality or 12 percent, then it almost becomes three and a half times. So although the intubation per se cannot be considered as the cause of mortality, but because it is always the uh, all-cause mortality that is looked upon in the studies, but definitely a fourfold increase cannot be looked uh, very simply or it can, can, cannot be set aside. So therefore, it is very important to understand that two preventive measures have been proven beneficial, although their exact roles needs confirmation. One is NIV after extubation in high risk or hypercapnic patients. Hypercapnic patients constitute a different entity because all the studies which consider utility, they try to exclude this group of patients because there are a lot of other causes for going into type 2 respiratory failure. And the other is steroid administration several hours before exclusion. So that is relating to it is, is, is a different topic altogether. So we are not going to touch upon it. 
but these measures might help to prevent post expiratory respiratory risk. So this was almost clearly demonstrated in most of the studies that looked upon the looked upon these aspects while deciding the ICU mortality. But only thing is that <clears throat> the RCTs should have sufficient power to evaluate reintubation rates because most of the time the sample size was calculated based on the winning phase. So out of winning phase, it was not calculated on the reintubate patient rates. So therefore, because always the focus has been always on winning failure or winning success. So therefore, sometimes these figures may be a little misleading, although not that much. So various oxygenation therapies are utilized to prevent re reintubation in acute respiratory failure. And uh, conventional oxygen therapy and NIV are recommended as post-extubation support devices. Conventional oxygen therapy by low flow has some problem because as told rightly that patients with a respiratory failure often generate a very high peak flow between 60 to 30 to 60 liters and only part of this inspired flow can be provided by the low flow system and the rest has to be entrained from the air. Now, HFNC can deliver oxygen concentration with a high flow rate. So therefore it can be used as a prophylactic post extubation respiratory support device. So that is a very simple logic that the risk of reintubation I, in compared to the standard oxygen can be reduced if this is successful. Now, if you look into this, you can see if there is a nasal cannula at six liters per minute delivering 45%, but the patient is taking at 20 liters only at 21%, that is room air. So how much will be the in the trachea, the actual percentage of FI to reaching the trachea? It will be just closer to 21% because you can just seeing the numbers, it, it, you can tell it. So to deliver a high amount of FIO to effectively to our patients, so we will need to match. So this oxygen dilution phenomenon, which occurs needs to be checked or it has to be neutralized. Now that is possible only in a high flow because if you are patient is now breathing a 60 liter at 45% and he's entraining, even if it is entraining 21% or 20 liter, then also close to 45% is reaching his trachea. So to deliver higher FI2 concentration, we not, not only just match, but exceed patient's inspiratory flow because that can only dilute, minimize the oxygen dilution. So therefore, it is very important to, uh, to consider the patient's demand, the patient's drive, how much the patient is hungry. So that is a very important clinical assessment guide that will can lead us to believe on whether how successful HFNC can be or cannot be. If the patient doesn't have that much of drive, probably it won't be make much of a difference, but if it is, then it can. So again, as was <clears throat> also told, I will, I will just repeat that continuously, the high flow washes out the upper airways. So there is flushing of the dead space at the higher flow because dead space has a limited. So beyond a certain level, it will not further reduce the CO2. So therefore it becomes stable after a certain time beyond 45 liters per minute, there is no further benefit. Reservoir of oxygen in the upper airway, that is the pharynx, which is available for gas exchanges increases. So again, rebreathing of CO2 and excess oxygen is available for breathing. So therefore the each breath that the patient rebreathes is washed out of carbon dioxide and is flooded with oxygen. So that gives the benefit. So if we just look into the acronym, H for heated and humidified, so provides heated and humidified gas. Inspiratory demands can better meet the elevated peak inspiratory flow. FRC increases FRC likely by the delivery of PIP, already told. Lighter, so it is more easily tolerable than CPAP or BiPAP. Oxygen dilution can be minimized and wash out of the dead space. Now, let us again look into the studies that have observed. Now, this was the first RCT which was compared the nasal high flow versus Venturi mask oxygen therapy after extubation. Randomized controlled 105 patients with PF ratio less than or equal to 300. Venturi mask in 52. Nasal high flow in 53. So this found that compared with Venturi mask, NHF results in better oxygenation for the same set FiO2 and extubation. So in use of nasal high flow is associated with better comfort fewer degenerations and lesser chances of inter, in, uh, interface displacements with a lower intubation rate. But the question also 
that these patients were not of excavation failure. These patients were only those ones who had a PF ratio of less than 300. So they may not be the ideal candidate to comment upon excavation failure based on these results. So we'll be going to the other studies. The effect of post excavation high flow nasal cannula on reintubation in elderly patients. So it was a retrospective study and a propensity score matched. So the severity was matched. But again, here HFNC was not associated with a decrease in the risk of reintubation. Now, here again, in this study, it was found that the practice of using NIV had changed that time because this study was published in 2014. So use of NIV in large group of patients had actually begun after the extubation, one day after the extubation failed. So therefore, such delay from 24 hours prior to extubation failure to 48 hours after extubation failure actually caused the problem. So again, this study could not give a, a, a clear verdict that why HFNC did not work well. Then came this study, high flow nasal cannula to prevent post extubation respiratory in high risk non hypercapnic patients, which was a, again a multicentric randomized trial, multicentric RCD. All these patients passed a spontaneous breathing trial. They were enrolled patients meeting criteria for high risk of failure. They were randomly received HFNC or conventional oxygen for 24 hours after excavation. Now, again, primary outcome was respiratory failure within 72 hours post excavation, and there were other secondary outcomes too. So, if you see that in this study, if you can see this was the conventional and this one, the study was stopped due to low recruitment of patients after 155 patients were evolved. The study was again inconclusive to a potential benefit of HFNC over conventional. Again, this study, the problem was that many of these patients during the earlier phase of the, of the ventilation, they were used very uh, NIV in the beginning. And when NIV failed, then those patients were taken to invasive ventilation. So subsequently, some patients who were not put on NIV and directly taken uh, on invasive ventilation were compared against those who had NIV plus IV. So ultimately, when it come, came to comparing these two group of patients, also a big fault was that some of the patients had failed NIV in the beginning, and the same patients were subjected to NIV in the post extubation phase, whereas some patients who did not require NIV were also subjected to HFNC. So this discordance also made this study a bit of fail. But then came this study in JAMA, effect of post extubation high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive on reintubation and post extubation extubation respiratory failure in high-risk patients. Clear-cut comparison, head-to-head. -head, no. <clears throat> so among high-risk adults who under, undergone extubation, high-flow condition oxygen therapy was not inferior to an IV for preventing reintubation and post-extubation respiratory failure. So it was a non-inferiority study. Not It was not a superiority or an equivalence trial. And <clears throat> then there was this post-extubation oxygen strategy as a systematic review and network meta-analysis the effect of NPPV and HFNC may differ depending upon illness severity and differences in severity may be an effect modifier. So therefore, the effect modifier, what are them? So this net, this was a network meta-analysis. So included RCTs with different characteristics, different duration of intubation, risk factors, as well as the methods of OPT. So therefore, they felt that the role of effect modifier was so much that a direct head-to-head comparison of NPPV, that is non-invasive ventilation in HFNC, cannot give a conclusive verdict on what is better than the other. So this was again another study which was published after that high flow nasal cannula versus non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in patients with heart failure after excavation. So they tried to identify that those patients because they're basically all a type 1 respiratory failure. So in critically ill patients with heart failure, there was no significant difference in the effectiveness of prophylactic HFNC in preventing extubation failure compared with NPPV, but they suggested that HFNC can be applied as the first-line therapy after extubation. So they gave some direction in trying to use it. This, so this was a 2014 paper. But then what Dr. Ghosh has pointed out as a, as a pilot study, this was a big randomized control trial. Effect of post-extubation HFNC with NIV versus HFNC alone on reintubation among patients at high risk of failure. 
So it was a multicenter RCT, 641 patients at high risk of extubation failure, that is more than 65 years or with an underlying cardiac or respiratory disease at 30 ICUs in France. So the patient, 306 patients on high flow HFNC alone and 342 patients, they were alternate. For 24 hours, they received HFNC. Next 24 hours, they received NIV. The primary outcome was proportion of patients reintubated at day seven. Secondary outcomes were many. Respiratory failure at seven days, et cetera, et cetera. We always put stress on primary outcome because the sample size is always calculated on the basis of primary outcome. So here again, you, you, you can see the, the, this difference was, was there. But <clears throat> in mechanically ventilated at high risk of extubation, the use of high plane is good. So therefore, then HFNC alone, this high flow nasal oxygen with NIV, that is alternating, alternate day, that showed very clear benefit. So even look, without looking at the PFAL only, just looking at the graph only, one can make it clearly that it was, it was such a beautiful benefit. I am not talking about the cost. The cost becomes an issue when we want to use both. But this is what this study showed, which was a multicentric randomized in 641 patients. Therefore, in mild respiratory failure, HFNC may avoid intubation entirely. So there are at times where the maximal support from traditional methods can be obtained and maximal support from HFNC can be obtained. So this is where it hits most. However, it in the Florelli study has already been pointed out intubation rate in hypoxemic respiratory failure. So this is this observation is based upon Florelli study, but it is also important that in severe respiratory failure, it may facilitate early extubation because here the green line is above the red line. So maximal support from HFNC is getting here. So it can actually allow early extubation. So my take home message would be <clears throat> post extubation respiratory failure requiring reintubation is a major setback for any critically ill patient because once the patient is reintubated, there is clear cut values to indicate the rate of mortality is high and which person will be the un unfortunate patient is, is not known to us. The most common cause of post extubation respiratory failure is inability of the respiratory muscles to sustain that work of breathing, which leads to muscle fatigue. And it is important to differentiate between preemptive respiratory support, which is initiated at the time of extubation versus salvage support initiated later when patient develops frank respiratory failure. So therefore, important to identify the high risk patients early and upon extubation, try and using the HFNC. HFNC may be a good option for a wide range of patients following extubation to reduce the risk of reintubation. In addition to supporting oxygenation, it improves ventilation by reducing the amount of dead space by the mechanisms that we have explained. Unlike NIV, it allows patients to eat and expectorate secretions and is well tolerated. And although NIV is supported by greater body of evidence for patients who are not candidates for post extubation NIV or who are unable to tolerate, but still HFNC can be a better option in most of them just because of the purpose it serves without causing any distress. Thank you once again. And I thank once again the Fisher and Packel team for organizing this webinar and giving us a chance to discuss on this important subject. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, sir, uh, you have answered most of the questions that we have uh, we got in the chat. So, sir, I have two questions uh, for myself, sir. Sir, uh, when we talk about the HFNC, uh, so what should be the minimum <clears throat> value of the flow and FiO2? We should one should start the therapy, or is there any algorithm to decide mm -hmm. what should be the value uh, one should start the therapy? Now, sure, it is very very simple. It is the maximum tolerable flow and maximum tolerable temperature. There is no other things. So the, is there any... the, the, the flow rate suggested by the company, uh, including yourself, has or the algorithm based on the age and other things probably do not have any value. What we have seen by the, the problem is the, when the HFNC was started, the physiologic studies were not conducted. If you see, the physiologic studies were published oh, well, very late. HFNC is there in the market for maybe oh, just over a decade, 10 or 12 years. But the FRAD study was published much earlier than the physiologic studies by Tomaso Maori and other people. 
So uh, when we actually show the physiologic things, that as we increase the flow, the benefits increase, except the patients who, uh, in terms of CO2 washout. But right. even CO2 washout doesn't deteriorate by increasing the flow. So the consensus now is to start with a high flow. Majority of the randomized control trial for any of the indications, they have utilized a flow of around 50 to 60 liters. So in our, uh, I have been using HFNC for uh, some over some six years now, and we should use, uh, start with 50 to 60 liter, 60 liter maybe, and if the patient tolerates, continue with the 60 liter. Okay. Till the time the respiratory failure settles. Similarly, if the, similarly it is the temperature. If the temperature uh, start with 37 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees, no thing, nothing like tracheostomically alert, they're separate from tracheostomy, separate for us. Start with 30. If the patient does not tolerate, come down a little bit, maybe 33, 34, whatever. You come down, but maximum flow, maximum temperature, provided the patient tolerates this. Regarding the, once we set the flow, once we set the temperature, we set the FiO2. We set the FiO2 just by dialing our flow meter. So we set the FiO2 to maintain a saturation 92% and above. Once the respiratory failure settles, then we start weaning the patient. Again, weaning depends, we, how do you wean? If the respiratory rate is settling below 30, maybe below 25, you start weaning slowly, slowly from 60 liter to 50 liter, 50 liter to 40 liter, something like that. So this is how HFNC should be delivered. It's very, very simple. Start with the maximum, right. now, okay. whatever benefit. Okay. So just I would like to one thing, yeah. even there is a role of, uh, I put the question in the question bank for the audience, even there is a role of HFNC in COAD patients. Though it is still, uh, you know, it's not there in the guidelines, but there is a role of HFNC in COAD patients. There are two randomized control trials which are currently under, there, there, uh, there is undergoing two randomized control. One randomized control trial is seeing the role of HFNC for Patients of COAD with acute exacerbation, but not the pH is still not decompensated. That means patient is tachypneic, mildly hypoxic, pH is still beneficial. Whether HFNC therapy, which can actually, uh, you know, dial the FiO2 in a right manner, it can be beneficial compared to the this, uh, this thing, the the, um, the standard therapy. The second FH, the role is HFNC is what about we give NIV? I use extensively NIV, but what about patients when the patients are not on NIV? We can we do not give NIV in a continuous manner. You see, you give NIV for maybe two hours, four hours, five years. In most of the studies, randomized control trial they use for two to four hours. We use for a longer period of time. But what about two between two different sessions of NIV? You see, between two sessions of NIV. What we give actually is normal plain oxygen. And there, the, uh, the, there is a decompensation or decompression of whatever achievement we have achieved by NIV. Maybe between the two NIV sessions, we can provide the patients with HFNC. I know the cost is an issue, but if we start using the HFNC extensively, cost will come down. I have my friend Harsha Agashe there in the thing. If he is still there, Harsha Agashe is a guy who deals with a lot of uh, manufacturing theme. Maybe we'll come up with some cheaper version of HFNC someday, and uh, maybe we'll be able to uh, reduce the cost. Even Fisher and Pickle may be able to reduce the cost. But we need to understand the scientific fact. Though no, between two H and IV sessions, we can still give HFNC, and there is a randomized control trial right now uh, in Italy is going on. Maybe it will give an answer in the next couple of years. So these are the two things I just wanted to mention. Okay, perfect. The main, problem, the main problem in COAD patients is that we, we don't want to retain their this drive. Is no, this is a this is probably a myth. We have been learning yeah, from years we together. Have, we have, it's a, it's we a have. myth that uh, this hypoxemic respiratory drive, when you give the patient in a controlled manner, giving oxygen in a controlled manner is much better than uh, giving uh, in an uncontrolled manner. So you give HFNC, when you apply HFNC, you give humidified air, patients, uh, uh, patient is more comfortable and you apply the HFNC in an exact FiO2. No, I'm not talking about the hypoxemic drive. I'm talking about the hypercaptic drive. 
Correct. Yeah. HFNC, so what we have seen, HFNC does not increase the PCO2 as such. So even if we can maintain the HFNC uh, flow between 40 to 60 liters per minute, the PCO2 remains. Um, so so probably we have to match the flow to an extent that the PCO2 doesn't drop down to an extent that uh, is. PCO2 done. never, I, I finished in my, uh, I've been using HFNC extensively in my, I have never seen patients PCO2 COPD. dropping COPD. down too much, even in, even in COPD, even in COPD. The, those, those, who never have, those, who, those who require CO2 level of say 60 and above for that to see. Uh, CO2 does not decrease too much. It just mm -hmm. provides the patient more comfort. Yeah, that is true. And, uh, and as rightly said that in between through three sessions, because three to four hours is the optimal time for NIV in most cases. And after that, once you at least half an hour to one hour of benefit is lost in the process that the patient is of NIV for two to four hours. So probably that is why these studies which have used NIV plus HFNC have found so much of benefit, particularly the one I showed in JAMA. That even, alternative. Even, in, even in Florida Day study, the yes. NIV arm, patients in the NIV arm, they received HFNC in between two NIV sessions. Yes. And uh, the, hmm. the study you mentioned this uh, high wind study. This is a high wind study by Arnold Hill. And there also they used HFNC alternated with uh, NIV. Mm -hmm. There is a question from the audience uh, that uh, can we use uh, HFNC post extubation in acute pulmonary edema? I don't think it is required. It depends acute upon the edema. cause, whether the, if it is cardiogenic, it has no benefit. Non-cardiogenic, you can use by not. So acute pulmonary edema, you don't need anything. Well, once mm -hmm. they are settled, they are very, they are, they are <clears> the <throat> easiest patient to manage in the ICU. Yeah. Okay, uh, just to summarize this, sir, so HFNC study can be used as a bridge in between the NIV therapy in NIV sessions, right? And it will even, it even if someone is using NIV, he also has an opportunity to use the HFNC and particular dose because we all know it is not possible to use NIV continuously. Right. Yeah. So whenever the NIV is giving whatever benefit, so that the benefits are not lost, so then also HFNC can act as a bridge to mitigate the loss of such benefits okay and, and so second question is like rock the rocks index uh, the paper were published in 2019 and later on in 2020 mm -hmm. uh, paper was published by richard in uh, you know uh, the rocks algorithm basically how to basically indicate See, the rocks. whenever you talk about algorithms and indexes na, they mm -hmm. always they have come they come with the lifespan because Within three years, you will definitely get a modified rocks index. Again, it will be validated. So validating of an index. So these are giving us a guide. But ultimately, we will have to see the trend rather than the absolute values. And I'm sure that in the coming days, rocks index will also give us a trend. And that trend will ultimately take us to the right goalpost rather than values. Values? Okay, Just to uh, answer the question, Himangshu. The, uh, uh, if you see the rocks in rocks, when we, uh, the, the, the base, the, the, the bottom line is we should not delay intubation. Right. Now, how can we prevent it? Now, just to prevent it, the first thing we consider is how severe is the respiratory failure in our patients? Patients, as we have seen from the Takeshi Yoshida study, that in patients who are very severely ill, if you, if you allow our patients to breath continuously in a spontaneous mode, there is a higher risk that patients will be worsening in future. So these are the patients where you have to be more careful. Secondly, patients who has got non-respiratory organ system dysfunction. For example, a patient who has got a respiratory failure, along with that, there is a, a renal failure, or also they have uh, maybe they have circulatory failure. The patient is uh, in hypotensive shock. May in these patients, probably delaying intubation is not good. You intubate these patients. Apart from that, we actually look for the whether the patient's oxygenation is increasing or patient's respiratory rate is decreasing. And ROX index is actually a combination of both these two: the oxygenation and the respiratory rate. So uh, as of now, ROX index is basically it's a use. Uh, it's a, it is is a simple algorithm. It's a useful algorithm. 
So I just wanted to mention is this. It, is it valid uh, for the COVID patients also? Like, can we uh, like uh, uh, for me, it? Himanshu? For me, we have given COVID a out of proportion look. COVID patients are not different, much different as far as my knowledge goes, and as far as the studies from other hypoxemic respiratory, for only for the except the for the fact that they were poorly managed compared to other hypoxemic respiratory failure who were managed before the COVID era because of the overwhelming number of the patients. So I don't think COVID patients are different. So even for the COVID patients, it will be equally valid. COVID patients are having ARDS, so it's the same. So, and uh, uh, so it can be valid for those patients also. I don't think it is. And uh, there is a question from the, what is ROX index? ROX index, I have mentioned in my presentation, is ROX index, yeah. ROX. ROX index is nothing but the ratio of SpO2 by uh, FiO2 and respiratory rate. So it's very simple. If the ROX index is more than 4.88, there is a high chance that patient will be successful in their HFNC uh, trial. Thank you, sir, uh, with this. And thank you so much for sharing uh, sharing the information and your experience in the of uh, HFNC therapy in uh, uh, respiratory distress patient and in high, and in post trust extubation. I hope our participant uh, like found this webinar uh, informative, and they will uh, implement these uh, you know in, uh, you know suggestions in their practice as well. Thank you so much. With this, we conclude our session. Uh, uh, very good night, sir. Thank, Thank you, you and good night to you also, Himanshu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Fisher and Peckel, for um, arranging and uh, studying and, and uh, propagating this very important topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you.